Good morning. Good morning. There's about a dozen or so of us here in the hall, and the beautiful snow outside it stopped at least for a little bit. I hope uh, people online are also enjoying the snow where you are. I can see a couple of you, maybe Tenkan and Evelyn. So this is the last Sunday for 2021, last Sunday um, gathering. And um, so I would like to answer questions or respond to any questions people have. It's been quite a um, vigorous 2021, and we'll be um, turning our gaze into 2022 here in a few days, and I'm um, quite sure that we'll also be a vigorous uh, 2022. Hopefully a little less vigorous than 2021, <laughs> but that's not always in our control. Um, so I'm interested what is in uh, people's um, hearts or minds here at the end of, uh, of this year as we start to think about 2022. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been thinking about the Tang Dynasty quite mm -hmm. a bit. It's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. A number of the Shastra, Shastras we chant mm -hmm. come from there, and great art and so mm -hmm. forth, and a vigorous Chan practice. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have much to say or something to say mm -hmm. about that time? Mm. So that that was the, um, let's say, you know, the birthplace of our tradition. Our tradition, meaning Zen Buddhism. Um, really came into flourishing at that time. And um, uh, I think, you know, in some ways, um, not so different than any other time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kind of things going on, but there was a certain kind of uh, stability in civilization and, um, and then in the capacity to um, explore further in the um, spiritual uh, life. I particularly appreciate the... Um, the, the emphasis in the birthplace of Chinese um, uh, or of Zen in China, the deep appreciation for uh, poetic uh, vision, which had always been part of Buddhism, but um, became a very strong through the association of um, association of of uh, Buddhism and the arts in particular, and so um, so much of our tradition flows through uh, an, a kind of I guess in other avenues we might call artistic expression, um, per particularly poetic expression. Mm -hmm. So even those, those sastras you were referencing, for example, are written in, in a poetic form. They're written in, in a poetry. The imagery that um, is uh, so much a part of our tradition, particularly within the koan stories, the um, teaching stories of, of Zen, uh, they, are, um, they come from that same, that same kind of area. We could say symbolic, but not symbol symbolic in terms of like a, um, um, allegorical, but symbolic in the sense that there's some things that you can only express <coughs> through a symbol. You you and so that is so alive in the Chinese um, poetic um, life or poetic tradition, and that really infused uh, Zen, and I'm so appreciative of that. So many things you can't talk about, you can talk about or express in a way that um, is like uh, getting the edges and then describing what the thing is. But you have to come from the center and you express it through uh, what ends up being a symbol, what ends up being, you know, if you talk about a bird flying through the sky, a bird flying through the sky is... Um, marvelous spiritual expression, which there's no other way to, you could try to explain it, you know, it's like, well, the sky is like emptiness and the bird is like someone traveling or something. But then it's like when someone explains a joke to you, you know, it's not funny anymore. It actually loses its power. So, um, so that uh, ability to express things through that kind of language became very strong in that period. And, um, and uh, I'm so thankful for that because I think that has so much to speak to our, um, our, our heart in a very 
you know, we could say different time and different place, but we have those same soul. So, you can speak through us. Maybe it's just some thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps we're heading for a new period of 300 years of creativity and peace. Yes, I think, I think we are, actually. Okay. <laughs> when it will start? Um, right here. Right now, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this the other day when I was first living in Japan. And um, for those of you who have lived in other cultures, particularly at cultures that have a very different way of conceiving of, a, of, of life, of thinking about things, talking about things, um, spent many years very interested in this different um, life of a Japanese consciousness and Japanese way of living. And I had grown up here in Oregon um, to mid parents from the Midwest, uh, one of working class parents from the Midwest. So that was a culture I was coming from. And a lot of time trying to sort that out as my life is so entangled in, in both of those. And um, I remember one time uh, someone pointing out to me, they said, you know, when, when I watch an uh, um, American draw a face, like when I watch a child, American child draw like the head of a person, they draw a circle or they draw some shape and then they start filling in the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Say. But if you watch a Japanese child draw the face, they will first they will draw the eyes and then the nose and the mouth and then they will draw the shape around it. And that's so why I paid attention to her for that while and it seemed to be true um, for, for the most part and how, how true it is over many, many people I don't know, but for me it became a representative of um, a couple different ways we can approach uh, imaging something, which is how we understand things. And one way is like, oh, we define the edge and then fill in the middle. And then there's another way where you come from the middle and then it comes out to the edge. And both have their strengths and both have their weaknesses. But, um, um, but it, I think uh, this poetic mindset oftentimes is more coming from the, in, is more coming from the inside and then uh, the center and then and then fleshing out and then maybe with the poetic expression you don't really get a clear line for the edge of the face you know you don't get to say oh go, there's the head um, I mean maybe maybe you do but the, it but it, it leads itself to a centered ambiguity as opposed to a um, uh, kind of encapsulated understanding which ultimately is a great fog you know understanding is a great fog like fog of our mind. You know, we stop paying attention because we understand. So anyway, kind of abstract, but <laughs> that's all my mind. Yeah. Looks like Tenkan, were you hey, Joe, leaning in? Uh -huh. um, and during Rohatsu, mm -hmm. you were telling the story of the Buddha's life. Yes. Which was quite good. And the last thing you ended on was him sitting under the tree and him being offered milk and also um, the uh, offered grass to sit on. Is this the end of um, the Heart Sutra says there's no attainment. And attainment was intellectual. You, you use your attainment to, to grasp something. Is this where he stopped that and started to grasp wisdom beyond wisdom? Yeah. I think that's a beautiful connection. That turn in the story where he um, can no longer keep the project of of a, um, either improving the self or destroying the self. Yeah. Like he can no longer align his path through that way of understanding. There is a big shift there where um, he, he can no longer, you know, just be successful in life in the way that he had been raised and was very successful at. He couldn't be successful through the kind of yogic improvement and he couldn't be successful through the kind of destruction of uh, the self. And um, those were all projects that he could carry out. He could carry out. It was his path. And he's, discover, you know, he's, he's working to discover something. And um, it's all very important, that, that self-directed um, uh, inquiry. But he had come to the limits of that kind of um, self-referential uh, spiritual um, journey. 
And so to receive, to me this becomes very, this becomes so important in, in, in the story of Shakyamuni Buddha, that his spiritual path was all along had been about receiving, but now he could turn his spiritual eye towards receptivity. Not only what will I move forward and accomplish or discover or know, but that to uh, take the seat of a Buddha underneath that tree of awakening is not only to move forward, but also is to, is to receive. And, um, and so this, this, is the, this is the unlocking of a gateway of wisdom. Um, and, and then there's no stopping there. There's no, you know, the reason the Buddha can be completely still is because there's no stopping. Normally when we try to be still, our stillness is in the, um, it's in uh, opposition to the hustle and bustle and difficulty of the world of movement. And um, that kind of stillness will always uh, fade or crumble or wear out. But the Buddha's stillness there was one where there was uh, no opposition to movement. And so total receptivity is what that stillness can be about. So we receive that same body when we, um, uh, when we sit Zazen. Uh, and, and I think that's very important because a meditation practice, probably all of us have to start with a, a mind of self-improvement. You know, we want to face something that we don't know how to face. And so we face it and we try to explore it. But then at some point, <clears throat> it's very important for us to start recognizing that we are receiving all the time. Even what we call myself, what I call myself is uh, something that is being received. And the uh, samadhi or the, or the practice of zazen becomes the practice of that receiving and employing. We're, we're receiving and we're doing. Um, and those things are not in opposition as we oftentimes think they are. Mm -hmm. um, this time of year, I, I always think about um, this musical album that I have, um, which is called Mass for the End of the World. Um, it's a recording of an a evening mass, um, a New Year's mass, New Year's Eve mass um, from the year 999 in, in Normandy, and in northern France. Um, and it's very interesting because it historically it really captures and the kind of anxieties of the society at the time. People were convinced that the world was going to end in the year 1000. Mm -hmm. So um, it focuses a lot on plague and famine mm -hmm. um, and uh, demonic possession of the leader of the you know the leaders of the time. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, it's just sort of so um, similar <laughs> to mm -hmm. sort of our anxieties mm -hmm. um, today. Um, I, I've been reading the Surangama Sutra mm -hmm. and. Um, in it, the the Buddha is um, in, in in towards the end, towards the, the the last half of the sutra. There is a lot of description and um, uh, warning about demonic states or um, these images of um, hellish realms. And I think that hellish and demonic are, are complicated translations, mm -hmm. probably. But um, anxiety, a lot of these anxieties and these things that emerge in our practice. Um, but there's a warning that, that is sort of repeated over and over again, mm -hmm. which is, don't mistake this for being a sage. Um, mm -hmm. Don't mistake these events, these things that come up, mm -hmm. for um, sagely kind of, uh, that you're, you're not a sage because you're experiencing this. And I, I, my question is, why would individuals mistake demonic possession mm -hmm. or these, um, these kinds of ang 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 anxious, uh, awakenings as um, they're becoming a sage. There is a clarity of vision which emerges um, uh, through um, different states of mind. And so if we just think about our ability, you know, you can look outside and you can see the white snow today. 
that capacity to see comes from a certain um, clarity of vision. But that clarity of vision is based on causes and conditions which become invisible uh, to us. But we are fully convinced that there is snow here in the yard. I'm not saying there's not snow here in the yard. I always want to say that. But we're fully convinced of it. Um, in the same way, in these kind of spiritual pursuits, in these spiritual realms, we can have a clarity of a vision which is unquestionable to us. And uh, the assertion of our knowledge that this is true becomes um, so um, undeniable that we live in that very naturally. Um, but this is not what the sage is. The sage is not the one that knows uh, these things. The sage is the one that uh, uh, does not make a difference between um, the deluded self and the awakened self. And we could say in a more um, pragmatic way, we could say is always questioning, is always uprooting views, is always in the process of undermining the assumption of the view. And particularly in these powerful experiences, we, we are overwhelmed. Um, uh, sometimes we can see that happening in our life in a really, you know, if, if you think about um, um, the way in which you're definitely like a strong emotional investment in a particular political reality. So I was over in Eastern Oregon or Central Oregon for a few days before Christmas, we went to visit my, my parents and brothers up in Salem. And, um, you know, just going into these stores with people not wearing masks, I felt all this emotion run through my, you know, through my body. And I'm immediately, I'm immediately sure that they are horrible. I'm just immediately sure that they are horrible. Now, the sage is one who can both recognize the truth of whatever that vision is and also uh, the emptiness of that perception which leads to other possibility. Um, the one who simply invests in that um, may be onto something but that's all you are is onto something. And, um, and, and I think this is very. This has become increasingly exacerbated. This dynamic exacerbated by our ability to see images so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we can give an image to our that that um, energetic movement that that fast. Either mostly not created by us, but created by someone else, and we can connect that image with whatever that feeling is. And so our vision feels as if it's very clear because we can see the image so quickly and so something that will correspond with our internal energetic sense. But that is a conditioned um, um, experience as all, condition, as all are. So then it's very easy for us to lose the uh, posture of seeing that it is a conditioned thing, which isn't to mean to say it's not real. Everything we call real is conditioned. <laughs> so that's not that it's not real, it's real, but it's, uh, but it's real in a way that has unbelievable possibilities. And my particular perspective of it will be uh, quite limited. Um, so this is what I, my, my experiences of this kind of, uh, if, if we go in a little bit more of a um, like spiritual vision direction, when for people who are inclined that way and it becomes part of their spiritual life, there's a, such a power there for, um, for deep understanding. But, there, but this dynamic becomes very dangerous because what we, what we see and what can be imaged, what can be imagined, can turn into a, a calcification like, very quickly in a way that the material world tends to speak back to us or we're more attuned to um, that world like, you know, the material world will will not just yield to your 
wishes, and and so we get some different kind of feedback in that in uh, in that world. Um, you know the very famous story of the I can't remember the the uh, um, the uh, ancestor, but he was a Tenzo, a very famous Tenzo uh, cook for the monastery, and he would say even if the Buddha himself appeared on the top of my pot, I would beat him away with a ladle. <laughs> um, but this is, this is a kind of part of the Zen spirit, which I think oftentimes gets taken to mean like we shouldn't have visions, right? Like all of that is monk, it's not Zen. But I don't read it that way. Actually, the fact he could say that means probably he was very visionary, but he knew the difference between um, trying to turn his pot into the image of a Buddha and meeting his pot as the Buddha. Those are, those are different things. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's also something really important for us to both respect the visionary capacity that we have and also, um, and also not try to reduce things to that world of vision um, because all of our vision is visionary. You know, our encounter of the, of the, of the pot in which we're cooking it's a totally visionary experience, as much as a golden Buddha appearing on the top of the pot is a visionary experience. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling now. Hi, Joe. Hi. Um, maybe in the same way to this, to ramble a little bit more about that. Um, last week, you answered a question from Issa mm -hmm. about Sambo Kakaya, yeah. which to me, it's just a word at this mm -hmm. point that yeah. I chant some dead breakfast. Yeah. I learned some of the other aspects of Buddha, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. And you used the words wondrous. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if, you know, this, you know, um, leaf and the sky, mm -hmm. you know, the wondrousness of that and going into 2022 and the wondrousness that we're sitting here right now. Could yeah. you talk a little, maybe I'm sure, sure. misinterpreting yeah, that word, but... No, that's that. Uh, so I, I, I made. Um, what did I say the other morning? That I didn't expect to say. It wasn't very nice. Um, not that I don't expect to say not nice things, because I do often. <laughs> I don't want to, but I often do. And I was referring to like a kind of. Um, oh, I think the term I used was flatlander Buddhism. Okay. So what I mean by flatlander is um, we again, through a process of how it is that we conceive things, we have a very basic a substructure of what we, what we think is verifiably true. And then our way of seeing the world gets aligned throughout that, those underpinnings. You know? So we're humans, we're here on a planet, you know, we're trying to survive. I think most people are trying to do their best by themselves and by other people. I think there's some people who don't. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different stories about how we could do that, um, but they're all, they're all kind of an allegory, or they're all kind of a, um, a story to help us understand what's actually going on better, what's our biology, what's our psychology, and all that kind of stuff. This is wonderful. I think this world is, is, is good. But the reason I call it Flatlander Buddhism is because it reduces everything back down to that set of um, of an idea of who we are or what we are. And the um, ascendant quality of our spirit and the part of our spirit which can go down into unknown realms is not really considered. It's, that, is, that is reduced to fantasy or reduced to the idea of just, it could be like creative stuff that people make up. That's the way that we talk about it. But if we look into our tradition more deeply, we'll see that we have, um, that's not how people are talking about it. That there is a wondrous quality of being that cannot be reduced to its explanation through other means. And, um, and so uh, I gripe about that a whole bunch, probably more than I need to. Um, the, the thing that's exciting about it is there is this possibility that is not confined to that flat land. And that capacity has to do with, uh, um, with uh, a quality of our being, which um, in many traditions is called heart or soul. In our tradition, we tend to call it mind. 
that translation mind is, I think it's what we have to use, but it's unfortunate in some ways because it's so mental, you know? And when we talk about mind in Buddhism, particularly in Zen Buddhism, we're not talking about mentation alone, although it involves mental. We're talking about something more fundamental. What's the very, what's the very, um, um, function of consciousness, we could say, you know, that when we say mind, that that's what we're talking about, not just kind of like what's in the locker of my head. Um, so when we want to explore that wondrous, when we want to enliven that in our, in our life, we don't want to just try to bring everything back down to that flat land. What do we do? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. um, to me, that becomes a question of, um, of our practice. In a very traditional sense, um, one way that this is accessed is talking about three bodies of the Buddha. One body of the Buddha is the Dharmakaya, Dharmakaya which is the all-pervasive, completely ungraspable and imperceptible body of awakening. Um, then there's the Nirmanakaya, which is the manifest body of awakening, that the awakening will show up with a shape like that corresponds to our conventional um, seeing. Yeah. And then this third one, which Iso was asking about, the Sambhogakaya, is an intermediary realm in which the, the rules of the Nirmanakaya, which is kind of where the Flatlander hang out in my story about Flatlanders, is, is an intermediary, intermediary world between this kind of explainable world and the world of total beyondness there emerges this mirror world. Mm. And that mirror world is a world of great wonder. And, um, and it is not less real than the graspable or explainable world mm. or the world that is completely beyond anything we could say about it. And it's characterized by um, uh, luminosity and um, it's characterized by a aliveness, which we oftentimes feel um, seeping away in our more conventional, our conventional world. So for a long time, I've been a big proponent that we, we include that part of Buddhism in what it is that we're studying, because it has such a medicine for our particularly industrialized, you know, we're living in, we say we're in post-industrial you know, we're in information age or whatever like that. But we are so marked by this shift that happened about 150 years ago that uh, um, a, you know, a couple hundred years ago started and, well, several hundred years ago started and really came to, like, in the late 1800s and then into, you know, post-war, post-World War II thinking of, like, a total mechanization. And mechanical things can also be wondrous, right? But we have now defined our being based in those based in those idioms so for example there is no reason for us to think that our consciousness works like a computer but that's the idiom that we use that's the organizing image and principle and there's good things about that we can we can understand things in a certain way by seeing it that way but but we don't that's not how we conceive of it we conceive of it as that's what it is and then everything gets tied back to that. There's another possibility, which is one way we could understand consciousness or one way we could think about consciousness is as a computer. That doesn't have to shut out all the other ways in which we could also think about how consciousness functions. Then a kaleidoscope of, of vision can emerge, um, which is very different than this, this kind of reductive way. Um, anyway, that's just more talking. Um, as a person who grew up in a Catholic tradition mm -hmm. and went back with her mama to church mm -hmm. many, many times and felt a kind of a deep mystic, a deep yeah. connection still, yeah. you know, I mean, some of the parallels I see there are like God the Father, God the Son, God yeah. the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's um, the Holy Spirit being the wondrous connection mm -hmm. yeah. between the two, the, you know, the three. Yeah. And, and um, 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 there was something else I was going to say, but it was way back, uh, mm -hmm. tied into one yeah. of the other things. So but this is something that you can, that you can uh, rely on 
and you can follow in practice. Mm -hmm. But we rely and follow on it in the same way we do anything. Mm -hmm. We don't just assert its truth and then, um, and then make our journey about trying to protect what we've decided is true. Mm -hmm. We can question it and walk into that world. And as we walk into that world um, uh, more, then things that we thought were true before won't be and things that we didn't know about will become. And that's the whole point of the journey. And it's reliable not because everything we feel or think about it is right or true in some ultimate sense, but um, it's reliable because we will get feedback from walking in that world. That body of the Buddha can teach us. And it's also our body, and it's also our mind. And, it, and there can be learning that happens through, um, through that. So I think for people who have a kind of mystical inclination, um, that it's very important for us to, um, to follow that and not to try to reduce it to something else. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, some people are not inclined that way mm -hmm. and is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and some, and, but I would say most people are inclined that way to some degree. So how do we find that, you know, how do we find that spark in ourselves? I'd spoken about poetry in, um, earlier on. I think that's one of the places where, I mean, an alive poem is just like undeniable. Unless you're a high school student and someone's making you read it and explain <laughs> what it means. <laughs> then it really, yeah. you know, it, it goes out. Flat um, poetry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or a flatlander approach to, <laughs> to it. Um, so, so, so what I'm always trying to recommend to people is not necessarily that you need to uh, have a big um, like uh, to-do about the Sambhogakaya and the mystical experiences and things, although some people will be very drawn to that, um, but to find, to feel for what is alive. Not alive just in the way of like, oh, this is neato, mm -hmm. but the thing where you feel, you know, when you see the snow and it's like there's something moving through your soul. It, it, you know, like, because there's snow, there's me, and because there's me, there's snow, and there's something moving through, I don't know why. And that's probably true of everything, but for some reason I can't feel it that way with everything. Then follow, follow the thing you can feel it with, and it will teach you. That's gorgeous. That's it. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey. Um... So above my altar, I have uh, a picture of the Buddha with uh, the 16 good gods of the Prajna Paramita. Yes. Um, it will, so in the picture, there's actually like 20 other beings, rather than the 16. Yeah. Um, but my main question is, uh, what is there a, is it supposed to be like symbolic of the, the, um, the Bodhisattva precepts? I just think of like 16 and 16. Yeah, that, that um, group of, um, some of you have seen that before. We, I put it up at New Year's. It's in my office now. I keep it up all year around. It's that same, same uh, assembly. assembly. It's called the Assembly of the, of the Prajnaparamita and the 16 Benevolent um, Deities. So those 16 uh, deities, uh, they're all... Um, different kinds of uh, beings that were bound to the Prajna Paramita Dharma as protectors. And not particular. I mean, there's no, I never want to say it's not symbolic of something because it being symbolic of something has more to do with how it reaches you than it has to do with what's its, how's it located in a sutra or in history, right? So definitely 16 Bodhisattva precepts are the protectors of the Dharma. That of, of course they are. Um, I haven't read anything that traces these sixteen back to the sixteen, you know, to the sixteen precepts in any really explicit way. There's a couple of sutras in which there's um, I don't remember the names of them, but there's one in which there's an assembly of twelve, and the other is an assembly of four, and that they get they come together in the sixteen for the Prajna Paramita um, sutras. The other four figures there are two figures from the Prajna Paramita and 8,000 lines um, uh, uh, who there's an important drama towards the end of that sutra about a, a journey, a spiritual journey that's made by one of the heroes of the Prajna Paramita and his teacher. 
And then there is the great translator um, of the Prajnaparamita um, uh, sutras and uh, his friend, who is the red, the red ogre with the sage in his belly, who traveled with him to help uh, protect him um, in his travels between India and China. So that's, that's what makes the 20 uh, that are there. Hi. Um, there's some, there's an element of like practice of relating with others mm -hmm. um, that I'm struggling with. Um, it feels like uh, I'm trying to like find some uh, some sharp edge, uh, some uh, kind of like alive sharp definite edge with them, mm -hmm. with with whoever I'm relating to, mm -hmm. and. Um, I feel like I feel like when I suppress that urge, mm -hmm. um, it's like holding a beach ball underwater. It pops mm -hmm. up at the least opportune time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then oh, there's the edge, and it cut us both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then if I'm like kind of indulging it, mm -hmm. uh, then that's also not good. It's um, destructive, uh, and it, I, I'm. I'm I'm struggling to find like a, a middle ground between you know, holding the beach ball underwater or like identifying with uh, finding, finding that sharpness. Yeah. So the way I hear what you're saying is exactly the problem of encountering anything. Um, and I don't mean that to, to, to like diminish what you're saying, that, that, but more to support it, that this is an instance of just ex exactly what is the, what is the, why is delusion delusion? And why does it, why does it cause so much trouble? Um, and and I'm going to kind of say back what you said, what you were saying, but in in some little bit different language. When we encounter um, an object of awareness, which could be a person or could be uh, a thing, um, that we we identify it as being what it is and we affirm its being through the shape that we encounter. And through that affirmation, all of what it is, all, all of its wondrous being gets reduced to that shape which we affirm that we have found. All of the possibility, all of the freedom. Now, even we don't mean it to, it gets reduced in that place. And definitely through human relations that happens. Like once we know who someone is, then we, there's like a clamp, there's like a clamp down. And so, but then on the other side, if we just say like, whoa, I will never have any opinion about anything. I will never, then we, we can't, we literally can't see anything. We can't meet anyone. We just live in the total potentiality. And, um, and it doesn't work to do like half of one and half of the other. Like sometimes I'll really, you know, I'll really buy into the shape and then other times I'll ignore the shape. We might need to do that to study, but that doesn't really take us out of delusion. Um, and so this is exactly what the Prajnaparamita teachings are, are, are asking us to explore, is what would it mean to see the form, see the shape, see the marks, and to see the non-form, the non-shapes, the non-marks at the same time. What would it be to um, both affirm the beingness of something and to not invest in it being a thing at all? That these two are not, they seem in opposition, but actually they are not. That, that, um, uh, the, and this is what we call prajna, is to see, is to see with that eye. So um, one of the gateways into that is just to notice, I mean, it's painful and you're describing it, but to notice that things just don't, they won't conform to the grasping. So the edge part, which is the affirmation, they won't conform to it, which is a source of pain. But at the same time, the incapacity for, or the, the, the incapacity, it's really incapacity, it's not unwillingness, the incapacity for that 
object of awareness, that person, to conform to my idea of it, is actually the liberation. There's actually invitation to, to encounter in a whole other way. That, um, that uh, you know, to know someone is never to have an edge. It is only to meet what is present, which can be, you know, in a way is an edge. It's the place where you're meeting. But it's not static. So you're meeting there again and again and again and again and again. And you may have some memory, you know, before I met, and it was like this and this pattern. It can get complicated. You can have karmic entanglements that make that, that meeting very rich and difficult or pleasant. But that it's never stuck in that, um, my idea of it. Um, with human relations, I think, is really the, the invitation. And, yeah. uh, uh-huh. It seems like uh, when you say that, like what I, uh, like what I seem to experience is if I it, a bias towards immediacy rather than um, some kind of um, distal is the word that comes to mind mm-hmm. through, through time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some bias towards immediacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, is that is that bias towards immediacy like destructive at some level towards like a uh, a greater harmonizing? Oh yeah, so I think that's a very that's a very um, uh, uh, very percep- perceptive that there can be a way in which we can play off the different scales with which we encounter another being by referencing a sharper and sharper immediacy. So for example, um, uh, I have a colleague that I just have a a really, really difficult time with. And I'm, um, I'm, I am in, I am in many uh, situations in which I need to rely on this person pretty, um, uh, in a pretty big way. And they need to rely on me in a pretty big way. And we, for whatever our karma is, we've been cast into this um, reliance on each other um, in in, in many different, uh, many different areas. So one way I I could, I could, I could just say, well, I don't, I can't hold any opinion of this person. Um, I just has to be at the moment that I'm meeting this person or we're trying to do something together. uh, What is true just in that? moment and I need to figure out, I need to forget about everything that has happened before and every, you know, and all of that. So, um, that's a problem because if we just, it's a, that's a, that's a practice of, of, of disregarding what it is that we can see. That thing that we can encounter is now being, um, killed in the service of the spaciousness. What I'm saying is that we will encounter another being on many, many different scales. And one of them is a time scale. So as I have more time uh, under my belt, or I should say we have more time under our belt, this colleague and I, who, by the way, I also think finds me incredibly frustrating, (laughs) Um, uh, that uh, there there are contours to our relationship and to this person's being and my being, which become clear and clear in larger pieces of time. That scale becomes really important. So for example, there's certain ways of talking about things which I just will not engage with this person in because I don't trust them. I don't trust, I trust they will do what they do, which is what I don't want them to do with certain kinds of things that I would talk with them about because because I've experienced that um, and it, there is a sense of who they are. There's an edge. There is a shape. But I could completely disconnect or could just say this person is untrustworthy and therefore that's who they are. And now the human relation, I don't think we could cooperate. I don't think we could work together at all because then we will. And I've been at the edge of that many, many times. In fact, almost always when I'm working with this person, I come to that edge very quickly. So I want to be wise 
I want to discern well about what is skillful and not skillful. But if I make this person who I think they are, now everything calcifies. If I simply try to ignore them by reference to immediacy or uh, just no connection, then, um, then the, the karma will just replicate itself and nothing skillful, skillful can really happen. So that's more what I'm talking about. Um, and, and I think what your, your perception of it's so, um, uh, I think very perceptive and sharp is that it's so easy, particularly within the Zen school, to just reference that kind of like, well, we'll just let things be as they are. You know, which is sort of an invitation to just letting the karma rule your life. And, um, and uh, that's, not very, that's not healthy. Yeah, I think um, that's, that hits the nail on the head is, is like, you know, where is that line where it's like, oh, there's something greater karmically going on and can that be interacted with or not? Yeah. 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 And I think we do, you know, as a side note, I think part of the karma that we carry as a culture uh, broadly defined where we are, the time that we, we are in, um, we have become very um, unskilled at difficult human relations. Mm -hmm. That we have a kind of underlying expectation that our human relations should be joyous and people should be cool and we should be whatever. And we've gotten rid of a whole bunch of the technology around um, civility, politeness, mm -hmm. what it means to hold in your opinion because it's not the place to express it. Um, because that's how we care for each other. All, many things that are part of a cultural uh, web of helping us to relate with each other well and be skillful, we've really, you know, we've called it too formal, we've called it too, we call it fake, we call it, and we've, we've jettisoned all that. But we still have this expectation that our interactions with other humans will be all of the things that politeness requires of the interactions to be. And, um, and then our sort of sense that things should be good is too strong, you know, is, is, I think is out of balance. Um, and that many of the, you know, again, if I, if I talk about this colleague, I think like, oh, what important person in my life? Not easy, but, but very important. Um, and, and how can we shift that mindset of, of realizing that difficult relationships oftentimes are very, very important. And that the easiest relationships we have may be not that nourishing because there is no, the investment that it takes to pay attention through difficulty is much higher than through, um, through ease. Well, just as a reminder, we will, you know, even if it's snowing, there will be a New Year's Day um, celebration here. We don't have all the little details uh, formulated, but those will be sent out this week. And, um, um, yeah, we, usually that's a kind of ruckus event with uh, chanting and drumming and um, fanning sutras and things. Um, uh, and so please uh, watch out uh, for that. And then uh, next Sunday, I think that's a Saturday. It's mm -hmm. the first of Saturday. And then our normal Sunday service um, <clears throat> next week as well. And then um, through the month of January, there will be various things happening at the temple. And then a practice term will start um, mid-February, uh, in which there will be many classes and things that are starting up again uh, as well. So this time is usually a little bit quieter at the temple, but there are consistent things going along. And of course, um, we're on the recess now through this week, but then starting up next week, there's people here all the time. So if you have a chance to stop by, please, please do. <clears throat> This and all our teachings are offered free of charge. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at buddhaeye.org and click the donate button at the top of the page. Thanks. Um.